But it chronicles an eight-year-old boy in his quest for a Red Ryder BB gun, and everyone he goes to meets him with the same response, which is, you'll shoot your eye out, kid. I'll spare you the YouTube video because we have some exciting uh, presentations today, but let me just start with that. So case presentation is a previously healthy eight-year-old male. He's a Native American boy who lives north of Montana who presented to an outside hospital in Missoula uh, with bleeding, pain, vision loss in the right eye after being shot while playing with the family BB gun with his younger brother. Uh, some social history uh, that is, I think, pertinent to this case, like I said, uh, he's from north of Missoula at a, uh, the Flathead Indian Reservation. And per his mom, they actually had the BB gun around not just for fun or play, but because they actually felt like they needed it for their safety in their area. On examination at Primary Children's, he was flown down here by a fixed wing plane, which is a whole other discussion because he had absolutely no way of getting home and no means to do so, but that's for another day. Um, he was pretty inconsolable. We had a really difficult time examining him, but he did have an obvious three millimeter skin wound on his inferior eyelid, um, and then questionable to no light perception. His examination, again, was very difficult, very unreliable, but we couldn't get him to reliably identify light at that time. This is his examination under anesthesia in the operating room. As you can see, um, So this is the penetrating wound that I was talking about here, which actually ended up being a full thickness laceration once we were able to uh, flip the lid and take a look at it safely. Of course, he's got 360 degrees of hemorrhagic chemosis. And then on further examination, he has a large inferior scleral laceration with extensive uveal prolapse which extended from the limbus inferiorly, macerated the inferior rectus muscle complex, and then extended posteriorly beyond, which we couldn't identify. Um, he came with some imaging when he came from the outside hospital, which uh, was actually a pretty poor quality CT scan, um, but it was all we had, um, which identified at first what was named as a, as a five millimeter pellet inside the globe. On further look, it looked like it may have actually penetrated anteriorly and posteriorly and maybe either residing on the optic nerve or somewhere in the posterior sclera. We tried to get some better views and then thought we had convinced ourselves that perhaps it was actually sitting behind the eye and that there looked like there was a layer of sclera closed in front of it. And again, here we thought, you know, this looks like it's actually penetrated through and through the posterior aspect of the globe. While we were in the OR in order to glean some more information, we didn't have uh, the amazing Dr. Harry available because he was at the VA, but we did phone him in. Uh, so I may ask for his input on these pictures, but uh, we did do a B scan and we were concerned that we actually saw a couple of hyperechoic spikes inside the vitreous in addition to the known pellet, which we believed was actually posterior. Um, in addition to the extensive posterior damage to the choroid and retina. Uh, and this is a better look at that hyperechoic spike with what we felt like was within the vitreous. Dr. Harry, I don't know if you have any particular thoughts. I know these are kind of limited in terms of what pictures we have available because they were intraoperative, but. Yeah, it looks suspicious for a foreign body signal. Uh, but the only thing is a BB, usually you see something bigger and you see a lot of ringing artifacts, you get around foreign body, you get these sound reverberations that just sort of go behind it. Okay. So it could be a fragment, I guess it's okay. the one thought that, Perfect. Of, of the BB. Okay, that's exactly kind of the, the conclusion we, um, we ended up with, which is when we looked a little bit closer to the uh, CT scan, as we sliced from anterior to posterior, what looked like there may be a fragment in the vitreous, as well as then the larger pellet that we could not actually identify with the B scan. So that was the theory we kind of proceeded with. Um, and we ended up going with a primary globe closure here. We did a sew as you go technique, which is just revealing as much of that inferior scleral laceration as possible. Um, until we could no longer go posterior. And, and unfortunately, that laceration just extended beyond uh, our capability to close. So we ended up closing the eye, sending the patient uh, with antibiotics um, and a plan to watch him very closely. 
And the retina team had been involved at this point, as had the oculoplastics team. Uh, and their, their call was to go ahead and just watch things as far as the posterior pellet and the intraocular piece. So I think this brings up two important clinical questions uh, with the management of this patient. First, what is the timing then for going into the back of the eye? When do we need to get involved with retina if we have a presumed intraocular foreign body? We have likely a posterior scleral rupture. Uh, how do we weigh the benefits and risks of going at a certain time? And then how do we manage this intraorbital foreign body? When do we go chasing after these pellets that are floating around the orbit? A little bit of background, because in November of this year, there was actually a case or a study that came out of um, Ohio that got a lot of news attention, and that is that uh, there's been a significant increase in the rate of injury from BB guns to uh, children. So estimations now say that a child is treated every hour from injuries from non-powder guns, which includes airsoft guns, BB guns, pellet guns, and paintball guns. Uh, this is the study I was talking about that caught all of the attention. Um, and basically, the study looked at cases from 1996 to 2012, sorry, 1990 to 2016, um, and looked particularly at all injuries and then at eye injuries from BB guns and other non-powder firearms. And they saw that there was a 30% increase in, in eye injuries. Um, BB guns account for the majority, so 80% of these injuries, and eye injuries account for 15% of the hospital visits and hospital stays from these injuries. Uh, not surprisingly, boys ages 6 to 12 were the highest risk group, accounting for approximately 87%. Take from that what you will. Uh, and here again shows the, the trend, which um, demonstrates the number of firearm injuries on your left-hand side and the rate um, of firearm injuries on your right-hand side showing kind of a steady decrease over that interim time period. There's this interesting spike in 2006, which nobody's been able to really study enough to know why that may have happened. And of course, people presume that these numbers are under-reporting the true scope of uh, injuries from these um, BB guns and non-firearms. Uh, Certainly, there's a couple of deaths every year and a couple of intracranial injuries. This was a story also out of Ohio of a, of a young man who ended up with a pellet in his brain. But for us, more pertinently and more commonly, we see devastating ocular injuries um, from these projectile metallic foreign bodies. Uh, study in Vanderbilt of tertiary care centers in the area estimated that 94% of patients end up with hand motion or worse vision at their final kind of visit. Uh, and then 57% of patients down the line after all their surgeries actually ended up without any light perception. So it's a real, really dangerous problem for us and something we need to think about. Um, so to address the first question, what is our timing of retinal surgery? And I hope there's a couple of our retina colleagues because a few of them were involved in this case. But this is a really delicate balance between stabilizing the globe, temporizing inflammation, but also not leaving the eye too long to uh, develop fibrosis and, of course, PVR. Um, animal studies and other human studies have demonstrated that uh, PVR develops usually within about four to six weeks of these types of injuries, which I think is a, a tough um, statement to actually make because we don't really know exactly what point this happens, and I think each patient is different. Uh, but that's certainly in the back of our mind as something that we're working against as far as time. But going in the eye early also has a risk of going into an unstable eye, especially if there's a posterior scleral rupture. Uh, so a two-step approach is what's favored in the literature and what we tend to do here at Moran. That is go ahead with a primary repair as we did. Uh, try to stabilize the globe itself, reestablish its integrity, prevent infection. Uh, and then go back for a secondary repair with the retina team to go in the back of the eye, assess for injuries, and then go ahead and treat as needed. The timing of this, again, is, is difficult. We used to, in the old literature, there's uh, in the 1960s some evidence to suggest we should go in within the week, within four days, to, again, prevent um, vitreo retinopathy. But data now suggests that we wait four to six weeks at least, allow the globe to stabilize, and then go ahead and go in the back of the eye when we feel like it's more um, kind of stabilized. 
There were some questions about avoiding cryotherapy in these sorts of traumas just because the outcomes of the burns from cryotherapy were actually worse. Uh, and then there's also been questions raised of scleral buckling in this situation. When is it safe to go ahead and put that pressure on an eye that's been compromised? Uh, I don't know if there's anyone from retina, doesn't look like it in the room, or anyone else that needs to come. Oh, Dr. Huang, any, um, any thoughts on, on this? Gun culture is very different in Germany from here. Uh, are there air gun injuries? Oh, is, that, is that a question. thing? Do children have little air guns with metallic colors? Very rarely. We have lots of these. Nerves? Nerves. This is definitely decreasing, but uh, not perforating, which is very interesting. Yeah, Dr. Do you think about when to go in? We tend to go directly. So I wanted to see if the retina people still think this, but it's a lot different if it's a penetrating injury that's not a piece of metal. I think that's probably something important to remember. The it's still evidence is bad for that. So you, so if it, it you don't, uh, so if it's a piece of wood, would you? Thank you. Oh, Dr. Larchell. Perfect. Perfect timing. Are they injecting individual antibiotics? Yes. The primary closure? Correct. Okay. Yes, yes. All of these primary closures involved direct administration of antibiotics to the back of the eye at the time of surgery, as well as uh, oral antibiotics for the duration that the eye was actually open. That's a really, really important question. I did not come across that, um, not something that was really mentioned in the literature, but it would certainly be worth looking at as you're waiting, especially if there's a known foreign body inside the eye. Thank you, great, thanks guys. Um, the next step with this patient, of course, is then addressing the piece of the intraorbital foreign body. Um, so this kind of goes to what, what Dr. Stagg was talking a little bit about, which is what is the material, how does this affect things. Uh, now, kind of quieter materials, including plastic, glass, and most metals, actually, um, the data suggests that if they're intraorbital and beyond the equator where you can get to them easily are actually often best left within the orbit. Uh, obvious exceptions to that, like Dr. Stagg said, uh, organic materials, so wood and plant matter that is a nidus for infection, iron, copper, and lead, which can lead to systemic and local inflammatory responses, um, would, would lead you to go and actually dive after a piece more readily. Uh, certainly optic nerve compression, fistula formation, and infection and abscess. Now, it's difficult because in the literature, some papers will say that actually leaving a pellet or a piece of glass or something that's actually abutting the optic nerve 
uh, doesn't change your visual outcome. And in this situation, I think that would be actually very important to consider because we do think this pellet is either sitting close to or on the optic nerve. And I think the question at that point is, well, as, as much damage that's been done already with the traumatic optic neuropathy of the initial injury, are you going to go in and worsen that by attempting to remove a pellet that's abutting the nerve? Um, and uh, I don't know, Dr. Marks was in on the conversation with this patient, and we elected to actually just watch this pellet, certainly while the eye was unstable, but um, uh, in the future, if we're going back in the eye, he actually elected to continue watching it given the poor visual prognosis. I don't know if there's anyone from oculoplastics here who wanted to comment on that. Dr. Patel? Thank you, Dr. Patel. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Um, I'll, I'll kind of hurry through the rest of my presentation to get on to the other two, but uh, things that came up with this patient is actually making sure that the correct CT scans are ordered at the time of the injury. Um, thin axial CT scans can be helpful in this situation. Um, so back to our patient, we saw him uh, back in clinic about 10 days postoperatively. He had some questionable light perception at that time, again, unreliable, but a formed globe, minimal discomfort, living his life normally per mom, good compliance, and the ability to follow up, which was a question, again, with his social history, would the tribe actually provide transportation, which is an eight-hour drive from Montana or not? So we considered three things, a nucleation of visceration in the setting of a concern for sympathizing in the other eye with a patient who lives in an aroma area, going in and exploring, taking out that foreign body, and then, of course, going in and exploring and uh, taking out the orbital foreign body. And, of course, we decided uh, to go ahead and allow the globe to, globe to continue to stabilize and then proceed with uh, exploration and surgery in the back of the eye. And then just as Dr. Patel said, to go ahead and leave that foreign body at the time that we do so. So he's coming back actually a week from Friday and he'll be able to uh, get that done. Uh, Last thing I was going to say is uh, Ralphie, I was going to call on Dr. Mamelis and say, well, why did Ralphie, this is him getting his Red Rider BB gun, why did he not shoot his eye out? And that's because he was wearing his glasses. Um, so prevention is huge in this case. Briefly touching on what Dr. Petty said, there's actually 
no federal regulation of these non-powder fire guns here in the United States. That means it leaves it up to each state to determine what the safety regulations are for these guns. Uh, and living in the state of Utah, of course, there are no regulations or safety uh, standards for any of these guns here in the state of Utah. Uh, so advocating for state level regulation, at least safety guidelines and trainings when you actually purchase these guns is something important for us to keep in mind. Uh, promoting protective eyewear and then of course educating our children and parents in clinic when we have the chance. So. Thanks to the amazing team that's taking care of this difficult patient. A few of you are in the room. I appreciate all your hard work. Mm -hmm.